guns. Yeah. Guns don't kill people, people kill people. Well, of course that's true, but uh, uh, guns aren't the problem. I don't know how we got onto this, but I got to tell you what, if I wanted to go out and kill 100 people today, I wouldn't do it with a gun. I'd get six people before somebody tackled me, right? I would take my car and I'd just start bumping people off on the road until I ran out of gas. And that is a much more effective way of killing people. Hey, you know, what are we going to do? Take away all the cars because Charlie runs over people for fun? It's stupid. People just don't think things through. That's, well, anyway, okay. All right. Sorry to get off on a tangent there, but uh, um, all right. Verse 12. Go ahead. Verse 12, anybody? And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, keep going. In the very same day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Jephthah and the sons of Noah, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. Okay, so the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. As I said, the number 40 is consistently in the Bible a time of testing, a time of trial, 40 days in the wilderness for Jesus, 40 years for the Israelites, 40 this and 40 that. So it, it uh, starts right here and it goes on consistently throughout the Bible. On the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. Okay, so here's the, the thing I was going to say in verse 13. It says up here um, in verse, um, where was it? Uh, they got into the seven. So when Noah with his sons and wives and sons went into the ark. And then down here, it says on the very same day, Noah and his sons. So it, it's very confusing reading this account. Did they go in, wait seven days, or did they, you know, it, it, and, but as I said, the purpose for all of this repetition and the way that it's worded is that chiasm I showed you on the board last week, where everything follows a pattern. If you weren't here, it's very interesting. I got it uh, somewhere. Uh, you can look at it. But it is a, a wonderful pattern it's right here, that is hidden in the Genesis account. And it says exactly the same thing going forward and backward over about two and a half chapters. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing that is hidden in there. You would never know unless you looked for it. Anyway, um, so, uh, uh, and somebody else, I think it was Diane last week, asked, uh, how did I know that Japheth was older than Shem? Shem is mentioned first, and she says, I couldn't find that. Where is that? And I believe it's 1013. Let me see here. Verse 10. Uh, it's not 1013. Hang on. I, I was looking at it a day ago, and um, uh, do, do, do. Uh, where is it? Okay, it's verse 21. 1021, it says, And children were born also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder. Now, some versions will say um, the, his older brother. The Hebrew is difficult to understand. Does it mean older brother or does it mean Japheth the elder? The smarter translators, like the King James Version, the people that contemplated why things are the way they are, were correct when they said Japheth the elder. It fits the pattern of the second replacing the first, which is consistent throughout the Bible. Always throughout the Bible, the second replaces the first. Okay, and so Japheth is certainly the elder of um, Shem. However, Shem is the chosen line. And what is that? That's the doctrine of divine election. God divinely elects apart from birthright, apart from birth order, apart from anything else. It is God who chooses. He chose Shem over Japheth for his own sovereign purposes. Okay, so if you have a translation that says Japheth, the older uh, Shem, the older brother of Japheth, it's not. I, I, I assure you it's not. It is Japheth the elder. Anyway, just wanted to let you know that when I see Diane, I'll try to remember to tell her that. And then start with verse 14. Go ahead. They had, had with them every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kinds, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to... According to its kind, and every everything with wings. Okay, now where does that harken back to? We already talked about that, but where does that particular verse harken back to? Genesis 1, everything reproduces after its own kind. We don't have dats, which is a dog cat. We have cats and we have dogs, right? So this harkens back to that, and it's just simply saying that nothing changed from the time of creation but almost 2,000 years later, or whatever it is, whenever uh, Noah is um, 
uh, bringing the animals into the ark, everything is still producing after its kind, and that continues today. We don't have funny animals unless we genetically modify them. Now, you can breed a horse and a, a mule. What do you, I mean a, a horse and a donkey, and you come up with a mule. They are of the same kind. This is... Right, I believe that's true. I, I, I think that's correct. Oh, gee, but I think that that has something to do with the order of things. That, that's right. There is an order of things, and certain animals can reproduce within uh, defined limits, but they can't exceed that. And that doesn't change. And like I say, we can try to make hybrids and all this kind of stuff. It's going against the natural order. It's something we probably shouldn't be doing. Not probably, we shouldn't be doing it. Anyway, but that's where that harkens back to, is the Genesis 1 account. It's reminding us that everything produces after its kind, which takes us to Isaiah 9, I think it's uh, verse 6. What is it? It says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The child is the man, the son is God. He is the unique God-man. Man reproduces after his own kind. God and man is the God-man. The, the pattern is set right there. Jesus Christ is unique in all of creation, okay? Anyway, um, verse 15 and go on. Pairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. Okay, so the pairs came with them. Mm -hmm. All right, everything with the breath of life came to Noah. God did that. Go ahead, Mom. The animals going in were male and female. Oh, now what does that tell us? Yeah. <laughs> right? What does that tell us, right? Okay, uh, Romans 1. Chapter uh, 1, verse what, 15 through 20, and in that particular area, and, and God throughout the Bible, Sodom and Gomorrah, the whole, throughout the Bible, you know what, we got churches here in Sarasota that say God is doing a new thing, and God isn't doing a new thing, and... Uh, They're saying God is doing a new thing. That one pervert that's the bishop of the uh, Episcopal Church, what's his name, Robinson? Oh. That's what he said when they ordained him as a bishop, he said, he said oh, God is doing a new thing. Oh, that, the bishop. From God that told him that. Uh, he just he's just a pervert and he wants to exercise his perversion. That's all there is to it. You know? The what? Gene Robinson, that's the guy, Gene. Anyway, you know what? And God isn't doing a new thing. He was down at St. Boniface a couple weeks ago, and like I said, if I had known that, I wouldn't have been here. I would have been protesting out front. But you know, they <laughs> snuck him in and snuck him out without any uh, without anybody really knowing about it. But that you know, my dad attends there. He thinks all of this is great and wonderful. So it's Whatever. Um, uh, they were male and female of every living thing, as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord shut him in. The Lord shut him in. Noah is on the inside. In the, now, y you know, you can look at this one of two ways. You can say that God provided a wind to pick the thing up and shut it or whatever. I mean, you can look at it. Or you can say that Jesus Christ, God incarnate, Jehovah of the Old Testament, is Lord. And if that's the case, then he shut the door. You know, look at it however you want. It's not specific. It just says that the Lord shut him in. The Lord did the action. The Lord carries him through the storm. You know, this is kind of a picture of our salvation. He finishes it. He does everything for us. And all we have to do, all they had to do was walk into the ark. And all we have to do is actively choose for Jesus. I'm not one of these people that believes that God regenerates us before we've made the decision so that we can make the decision, like you know, R.C. Sproul does. He thinks that everything is a work of God completely. God doesn't interfere in our free will. And, you know, so here's, here's something. I might as well share this with you because somebody, actually, I got two questions in one day, the same question in one day, and uh, which happens from time to time, but... Somebody said, how do I know that I am in God's will? And we'll just divert here from a second while it's on my mind so you, we can talk about it. How do you know when you want to make a decision if, you know, people are always saying, I think God is leading me here. You know, God is, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, God wants me to marry this girl or whatever. How do you know if you're in God's will or not? You wonder that too. Okay. I'm going to tell you what I think. Does anybody have an opinion before I give what I think? Here is what I think. I think that God has given us free will. I think that he doesn't interfere in that free will. God allows us to make our own decisions. So here, here is what I told the people. Here's my example. I am living with this girl. I've been having sex with her for five years. She's not a Christian and I'm a Christian. I think that God is leading me to marry this girl so that she can become a Christian. That's not God leading me. That, not at all. Because I'm already violating the, the Bible. 
She's not a Christian. I'm not to be unequally yoked. Now, that verse doesn't specifically pertain to that, but people use it all the time, and it's a good analogy. We should marry within the Christian faith. But anyway, um, uh, we're, I'm being unequally yoked. God could not be leading me to do something that is not in his will. That's all there is to it. Okay. Now, the one thing that I know will happen 99.9% to 7% of the time is that she will get farther away from Jesus, not closer once you're married. That's what people tend to do. They tend to go to, you know, you, you, you get married and you tend to love each other for a month and pretty soon you realize this person has faults, right? And you, those faults get magnified until you grow up and are willing to overlook them. But the person that is not a saved believer is going to deviate further. And I've seen it happen a million times. Now, that's not to say that they won't come to Christ at some point. But normally, that is the pattern. Because you have different priorities. Your priority is Jesus. And either you're going to let your faith wane, or this person is going to move away, and you're going to get closer to God. One or the other. You never are in a state of... of uh, what's the word where you're not moving forward or backward? Stasis. You're never in stasis. You're either moving forward or you're backsliding. If you're backsliding, it's because of her. If you're moving forward and she's not, then you're getting farther apart. Okay, so if I am dating a nice Christian girl and I love her, okay, and I want to marry her, we've never touched each other, we've had great dates and we like each other a lot, is God leading me to marry her? Okay, I don't think God interferes in those type of decisions. I just don't think he does. And what we do is we say, I've done nothing wrong. She is a good mate. She's a Christian person. You pray to God and say, God, if this is meant to be, may your will be done and not mine. I am going to ask this woman to marry me. You have free will to do that. And then she has a choice to say yes or no. But you have sanctified what you want by prayer. And Paul talks about that all the time. Sanctifying things by prayer. Sanctifying things by prayer. If you are in God's will and it's something that you want to do, you want to start a church and you are in God's will doing it, then pray about it and start a church. It may or may not succeed. Go ahead. Charlie, I have to say that you know Jim and I were at the very, very bottom. I mean, we had been sued by an old employer. Right. And we were, the housing market over there was in the pits. I just didn't know what to do and it brought me to my knees. Right. And I just prayed, Lord... I will go anywhere. I want to be near Robin, but I'll go anywhere. And I really, truly meant it from the bottom of my heart. I mean, I was just bawling. I was crying. Right. And I meant it. And it, and it's just like, it's like it, so many doors just opened, opened up. Opened up. And everything just sure. fell into place like a puzzle. And it was in, within yeah. three months we were here. Right. Nobody was selling homes over there. Right. I mean, it was just... And I hear that all the time. Why? Because you were in God's will. And you've done nothing wrong in the process that would keep him, or hinder him from blessing your... To him. And I right. said, yes. this is your will, Lord, I will do it. If right. your will is for us to be in Timbuktu, I will go. Right. Because that's the point that we were at. And mm -hmm. so I really feel that, you know... And that, that is God. exactly the point, is that it, I don't think God leads the way that people claim he leads. Because they say, I think God is leading me to do this. And then the business fails. And now what do you do? You say, I guess God wasn't leading me. Then that means that you had a wrong impression of what God was doing before you started. And people use that terminology all the time, especially in charismatic churches. But I hear it in grace all the time, too. Is people say God is leading me when the next year it was apparent God wasn't leading him. He was allowing them to make a free choice. And what, what, when do we use the term God is leading me? It's when it's something we want. Yeah. It's always something we want. You know, Charlie, even in, that, even in that whole scenario, we got a low, much lower price for our house. We could have said no, yeah. but I had said, you know. Whatever you want, Lord. Whatever you want. That's and, right. You know, I mean, Jim and I didn't agree on a lot of stuff that was going on, but you know what? We, I, just, I just... He blessed it. it. Yep. Really? Well, I'll tell you what. I, I have two children, and... Out of my two children, both have given me immense grief at one time or another. I think everybody here has had the same thing. Okay, so here is what a pastor said one time, and I thought, you know, that's a hard thing to do, but he's right. He said, you know what, if, if, are you willing to give up anything, anything to be in the Lord's will? And I thought, you know, about the one that was giving me the grief at the time, and I said, Lord, if it's your will to take him or her, I won't say what, then, then your will be done. I would rather have you happy than have my child living with me. I would rather have you take them.